How's it going everyone? It's Chow here and today we are going to talk a little bit about reading phylogenetic trees. So let's get started. Okay, so this is a topic that tricks a lot of people and makes a lot of people struggle on exams. So I can't really get into the nitty gritty details about it because that would take an extremely long time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some of the basics and hopefully you can see some patterns that you can use to either A, construct phylogenetic trees, or B, look at variations and similarities between different species or di different lineages within a given phylogenetic tree. So let's get started. Okay, so the first step, of course, is just a quick review of everything. We have sort of three main groups when it comes to phylogenetic systematics. We can look at groups that are monophyletic, groups that are paraphyletic, as well as groups that are polyphyletic. Now that being said, oftentimes when we look at analyses, especially of related species, we're really looking only at monophyletic groups, also known as clades. And this is what will oftentimes will be the most useful in helping determine similarities and differences between different lineages or maybe perhaps different species. So when you look at a phylogenetic systematic analysis, there are often these things called phylogenetic trees, which you should know at this point. Usually there's some kind of a ancient common ancestor that's shared between all of the lineages at some given point. So there is some kind of a common ancestor very, very far back in time where every single derived lineage came from. In addition, you see these little um, nodes over here. So these nodes, those are the splittings of the branches of the phylogenetic tree. And they often just designate a, a location in a given time where um, some kind of a division between an original lineage occurred. So you can think about it maybe in more recent sense as a, a location in time where one species perhaps diverged into two species or one lineage diverged into two lineages and those lineages can then maybe diverge into more lineages as shown here. So the positions of the nodes on the time scale, if present, uh, indicate the times of the corresponding speciation events or division events. What's really also fascinating is that the branches in phylogenetic trees can swivel on the nodes. So you can see over here we have the human and the chimpanzee over here that um, split from this one node over here. And you can see that you can, you can swivel the nodes and change the position as to where the organisms are placed. So you can have the chimp on the top or the human at the bottom, or put the human at the top and the chimp at the bottom, as long as you are keeping everything else intact. If you're just switching and sw swiveling the nodes, the tree stays the same. So this tree over here and this tree over here are exactly the same, they're identical. But you can see that it can get a little bit confusing because in this particular tree, the human is farther away from other primates like gorillas and orangutans, whereas here the human seems to be closer. But this is just sort of an optical illusion because from a scientific and phylogenetic standpoint, this tree and this tree are showing the exact same information. So that's something very important to keep in mind. So let's look at this tree over here. It's a very simplified tree that I think is very useful for getting you started on separating similarities and differences as well as relatedness between different lineages. So we have a fish, we have a frog, we have a snake, we have a rat, and then of course we have a human. So if you look at this tree here, the out group is the fish. It's the most basal lineage. It's the one that's most unlike everything else. And again, you can actually swivel the nodes and keep the phylogenetic tree the same. So if you, you swivel this node over here, you can put the rat to this position and the human to this position as shown here. And this tree and this tree are exactly the same. So once again, you can swivel the nodes and still keep um, the tree to be the same. You can actually do that with this node over here too. So you can move the snake over here and the human over here. So you have the human and then a branch that is of the rat. And so you can swivel all these nodes around and it still would be the same phylogenetic tree. You can't just shift the different lineages and the different, uh, so you can't like just move snake over here to the most basal lineage. You can't do that, but if you swivel the nodes, the entire tree will stay the same and show the same information. So again, that's one very key fact to keep in mind as you're working through some of these problems. 
So let's take a look at this tree itself and look at relatedness with three separate examples that will most likely encompass everything you need to know for reading phylogenetic trees and determining relatedness. So first of all, we have humans are more closely related to rats than they are to snakes. So you can see humans and rats share a common ancestor more recently than they uh, with snakes, and, and that makes a lot of sense. I think this first statement is pretty straightforward. If you look at the second statement, frogs are more closely related to snakes than they are to fish. So you can see frogs over here and snakes over here. You can see that their common ancestor is a little bit more derived than the fish common ancestor over here. So frogs share a more recent common ancestor with snakes than they do with fish. So they are more closely related. So the frog is more closely related to the snake than they are to the fish, which um, they share a common ancestor, but it's farther back in time. Now, number three is the one where it just kind of tricks a lot of people, and it takes a, a little bit of thinking to get an understanding as to why that's the case. So if you see over here, this statement is correct. Fish are equally related to rats as they are to frogs. So if you look at it from just you know eyeballing this phylogenetic tree, it doesn't seem right because the frog is closer to the fish than it is to maybe, um, in this case, the rat. And the rat seems very far away from the fish. But the reason why number three is correct and that fish are equally related to rats as they are to frogs is because of something very, very critical, and that is that common ancestor. So if you think about it, um, rats and frogs both share a single common ancestor over here, whereas this common ancestor for fish is farther back in time. So because rats and frogs both share the same common ancestor over here, neither species is more closely related to the fish. They have the same common ancestor over here, and so they're really closely related to each other and not so much the fish, which has a common ancestor with frogs and rats farther back. But you can see that there's a bunch of branches over here that can make things really complicated. But in this sense, one thing you can think about is how nestled hierarchy, so this hierarchy over here that's nestled within this group, express the same relatedness to a branch prior. So nestle hierarchies express the same relatedness to a branch prior. So frogs, snakes, rats, and humans are all equally related right, to the fish when you're looking at this nestle hierarchy over here because they all share this one common ancestor at this location. However, if you're looking at species which branch prior to the nestle hierarchy, so um, let's say our nestle hierarchy is this over here, so just frogs, snakes, rats, and humans again, and if you see a branch that's prior to the nestle hierarchy that we're talking about, aka the fish over here, then they show less relatedness. So this is something that's a little bit complicated that you should step back and think about for a second. So again, nestle hierarchies, in our case, the frogs, the snakes, the rat, and the human, that's the nestle hierarchy that I chose, they show the same relatedness to a branch prior. So frogs, snakes, rats, and humans show same relatedness to the branch prior, in this case, our fish. So frogs, snakes, rats, and humans are equally related to the fish. What's really then fascinating is that any species which branch prior to the nestled hierarchy, so any species that branch prior to the nestled hierarchy over here, in our case, the fish is the one that branches prior to our nestled hierarchy, they express less relatedness. So again, this is a very, very complicated thing that perhaps gets a lot of people. The first two statements tend to make a lot of sense. The third one, maybe not so much intuitively. So step back, think about it for a second, and hopefully uh, you found this video at least somewhat useful. Um, it is a very complicated topic, but it's a topic that if you master, you'll do very well in all of evolution classes, and usually they like to throw a couple of these at you um, on the exam. So I believe that's all I actually have for this video. I hope you found it useful, as, and as always, best of luck studying, and let me know if you have any questions.